Okay, uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the APRU Sustainable Cities and Landscapes webinar series. Uh, today's session is Planning, Design, and Climate Actions for Renewable Energy Transition, Lessons from the Pacific Rim, hosted by Professor McKenna Kaufman, the Director of the Institute for Sustainability and Resilience from the University of Hawaii, Manoa, and myself, Ye Gang Go, the Director of the APRU program, APRU Sustainable Cities and Landscapes program from the University of Oregon. So this is our 11th uh, and the last webinar session in our webinar series. Thank you so much for um, joining us today. Uh, before we get started today's webinar, I just want to mention a couple of things about APRU and our Sustainable Cities and Landscapes uh, program. So for those of you who are not familiar with APRU, first of all, APRU is the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. It's a network of 60 leading universities linking the Americas, Asia, and Australia. Australasia. Uh, we leverage collective education and research capabilities of our members into the international public policy process. The System of Cities and Landscapes program is one of the APRU's primary research programs, and we collaborate on effective solutions to the challenges of the 21st century. And SCL Hub has 19 core members, uh, member universities across the Pacific Rim, and the hub is housed at the University of Oregon. So SCL Hub successfully held four annual conferences in Poland in 2017, in Hong Kong in 2018, and Sydney in 2019, and Auckland virtually in 2020. And each conference offered various activities that students and practitioners and uh, scholars can participate in, such as uh, research working groups and a design field school, a student design competition, and a research symposium for PhD students. In 2021, uh, instead of our annual conference, we, off we offered um, a live webinar series organized by our working groups and celebrating our fifth year uh, anniversary. So all the previous webinar recordings are available on the APRU SDL webinar series webpage. And the lastly, um, one exciting news is the forthcoming Rowage Handbook of Sustainable Cities and Landscapes in the Pacific Rim. It's coming really soon. The February 23rd is the publication date. The handbook explores the new ways of understanding sustainable cities and landscapes. The handbook includes over 60 case studies across the Pacific Rim and 64 chapters contributed by 116 authors from eight, uh, 38 institutions across the Pacific Rim and including the energy section uh, contributed by today's speakers. And uh, McKenna will give a more overview later. So I hope you continue to join us and explore how cities and regions across the Pacific Rim address climate change and social equity to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And please contact us through email, uh, visit our website, Facebook, or Instagram if you are interested in participating in our, uh, our activities. And thank you and enjoy today's webinar. Now I'd like to pass on to today's webinar's moderator, Professor Martina Kaufman. Thank you, Yekang, for the introduction. And I'm very happy to be moderating today's session as well as um, talk a little bit more about the handbook that's coming out later this month. Um, so the session today is organized around section five of the handbook which is Renewable Energy Landscapes Across the Pacific Rim. And we have three of our six uh, chapters that will be discussed in depth uh, within today's presentations. Um, and just, you know, in terms of the scope of this, this section five for the handbook, it covers, you know, the urgency of climate change, the need for deep decarbonization, and then, you know, some of the, the social political uh, issues with transition as well as land use issues with transition that we'll hear quite a bit more about today, um, but also a lot of emphasis on what are those solutions, solutions in terms of co-location for land use, um, solving for multiple objectives and multiple benefits, uh, site design with solar PV that Kirk Diamond will talk us through today. And so for those of you who are interested in this topic, please um, check out the handbook when it comes out later this month. And with that, I will 
um, kind of turn this over to our, our presentation for today on planning, design, and climate actions for renewable energy transitions, lessons from the Pacific Rim. We have great presenters, Brendan Barrett from Osaka University, Yekan Ko, who you just met from the University of Oregon, Xiaowen Wang from National Cheng Kung University, and Kirk Diamond from the University of Arizona. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna get this transition and I will get Brendan's uh, presentation up. And we will run through the presentations um, and then open it up to our panelists for a, a dynamic Q&A session. Um, I will ask that everybody put their questions for our panelists into the chat so that we can, um, so that I can see it all in one place. So there is a Q&A box and there's also a chat. Please ignore the Q&A and put your questions for our panelists into the chat so I can keep, it all, keep track of it. And with that, I will uh, start Brendan's presentation. Yeah, I'd like to talk about the energy transition, particularly at the sub-national level and how that ties into the climate action. Uh, we've seen recently um, the emergence of a number of uh, decarbonization proposals that really talk about trying to reach 100% uh, carbon free electricity or carbon zero electricity by 2035. And I think this, these roadmaps are very important because we're beginning to see what uh, rapid decarbonization could look like in, in various contexts, whether it's from the work of the International Energy Agency or these reports coming out um, in the United States looking at uh, transforming the electricity supply system. Um, what's really interesting and what's really crystallized through the at COP26 last year is the, this uh, net zero by 2050 target. And actually it's quite a new idea going back to the Paris Agreement and then uh, really solidified by the 2018 uh, IPCC special report. But there are still some concerns that, um, that 2050 is perhaps too far in the future and maybe we need to adopt a, a different approach because the reality is that you know, 1.5 degrees as a, a temperature increase target is still alive, but, but barely as a result of the COP26 negotiations. And in this particular presentation, what I'm focusing on is some of the more ambitious proposals that are on the table from local governments. And in this particular instance, there's you know, an example of Copenhagen that's trying to be net zero by 2025, Leeds in the UK by 2030, Oslo by 2035, uh, San Francisco by 2040, um, the Australian uh, Capital Territory by 2045, and then Fukushima Prefecture in Japan, 2050. That 2050 target for Japanese local governments is actually something really new, only after the uh, uh, previous prime minister uh, declared a net zero 2050 target for Japan, and then suddenly the local government started to move in that direction. So in terms of the energy transition, you can see, for instance, in Australia, the capital, ter capital territory, when they actually um, reached 100% renewable energy in 2020, it was really possible for them to bring forward their uh, decarbonization target from 2050 to 2045. Likewise, in San Francisco and also in Fukushima, there are very clear and ambitious renewable energy targets. The situation is a little bit more complicated for Oslo, Leeds and Copenhagen, because to some degree they're dependent upon national policies, national energy policies to actually achieve, for them to achieve 100% renewable energy, for example. The other big challenge we face is that not all local governments have the same level of ambition. So a recent report from um, from the Brookings Institute in the in the U.S. Uh, reveals that a large proportion of U.S. Uh, large cities do not have established uh, emission reduction targets. Um, moreover, another study analyzing um, a, a few cities actually identified the fact that they that cities struggle to set up greenhouse greenhouse gas accounting systems and uh, struggle when choosing data, um, system boundaries, baselines, etc. So this is, a, this is potentially highly problematic for us going forward. 
the interesting point now is to think about what is accelerated decarbonization and uh, the UN in the emissions gap report that it published last year actually start to try to visualize this so you can see for instance there's a linear uh, scheme where we go from now to uh, net uh, zero carbon by 2050 as a straight line accelerated according to the UN is where you actually have a steeper curve very very quickly and uh, delayed is where you don't start reducing emissions from for a few years from now. And it's amazing, actually, there are very few countries that fit into the accelerated uh, category. Uh, for me, I actually define accelerated decarbonization as reaching net zero by 2035 or sooner. And as you can see, some of the um, cases I'm presenting today are actually sooner than that. Um, you can see that Copenhagen uh, initially struggled to reduce emissions, but once it uh, made the commitment, it's having this very dramatic uh, accelerated um, line. Uh, Leeds is also very similar. Oslo actually, um, again, faced quite a significant delay, but then has had very uh, accelerated decarbonization. And um, Aus the Australian Capital Territory is also quite similar. Uh, what's of concern is Fukushima Prefecture, where you see that they've delayed um, actually reducing emissions. And, and one problem was the Fukushima nuclear accident, which resulted in emissions increasing as Japan adopted more, more coal-fired uh, electricity generation. So then they have a bigger challenge of trying to get down to net zero by 2050. Um, in, our, in the analysis that we've been doing with my colleagues, uh, we're actually identifying various factors that influence the speed of decarbonization. And they are uh, in relation to policy development, whether you have a robust emissions uh, accounting system, uh, your methodology is very clear and internationally recognized, you've got transparent assumptions. Even something as important as a climate emergency declaration can have a huge difference in how the local government and the local community responds to the uh, climate mitigation challenge. And then on the other side, there are lots of positive measures that can be implemented, um, including going to 100% renewable as quickly as possible, um, promoting technology and uh, social interventions, um, really focusing on both energy supply and demand, uh, trying to shift com uh, consumer practice and behavior, um, innovating within whole systems, not just promoting EVs, but also promoting the infrastructure, the charging systems, um, green electricity, um, EV recycling programs, and so on, looking at the interactions between across boundaries, across municipal boundaries, between different sectors, energy transportation, and so on and so forth. And then also, and this I think is really important, phasing out uh, unsustainable technologies. So we did an analysis, as you can see, just using a tra simple traffic light system. And what this chart shows is that the more um, green, we're actually saying green being basically uh, examples of really good practice, the more green uh, traffic lights you have, the more effective that your uh, decarbonization is, and the more likely you are to reach a, a, an accelerated uh, target date. Um, now, a quick example from Leeds. Here you can see that Leeds um, in England uh, started out by making a solid economic case for decarbonization. They then have a climate uh, emergency declaration, which played a key role in setting that 2030 target. They have a detailed uh, climate roadmap from 2019. They've implemented a three month, month consultation with citizens. It's that kind of long conversation that's really important for citizens to understand and also contribute to policy development. They then had a citizens uh, climate change uh, jury and that jury produced a report based on expert advice. And what's interesting that the city then came up with this uh, pathway, detailed, very detailed pathway to net zero. <coughs> and what you can see actually is that the 
even the work of the citizens jury and the recommendations they made, if, if implemented, would actually result in um, faster emission reductions. I think it's something in the order of an extra 10% um, in terms of what can be 10% deeper reduction as a result of implementing those recommendations. So it's a really important, as I've mentioned, that local governments adopt consistent methodologies. And that includes consideration of scope three uh, consumption emissions, which many local authorities don't currently account for. But it's really essential that your local government is doing it properly and is applying uh, either the, the, uh, the global protocol for community scale greenhouse gas emission inventories or other uh, internationally recognized standards. Um, tying all of this into the local government expenditure is really important. Oslo is a, is a fantastic example of a local government that has a climate budget, uh, but uh, even more importantly, it's to make sure that all local government uh, spending aligns with the mitigation target and doesn't go in the opposite direction. And so very careful consideration needs to be given for about the funding of projects that actually undermine the climate mitigation goals. So my um, final takeaway message for this presentation is that um, accelerated roadmaps, pathways and targets are actually align um, more very closely with existing modes of governance, policy making and funding cycles. So the further away that we put these targets, the less likely that current expenditure patterns, current policies are going to be in alignment with that. And, uh, and it's also the greater likelihood of um, non-climate friendly policies and expenditure uh, policies being sustained um, uh, over a longer period of time. And finally, the issue with this longer term approaches, and within that I would include this net zero by 2050, is that it really encourages policymakers of today to just push the implementation burden down to future leaders. I think this is irresponsible, but it also has the impact of actually slowing down um, the development and diffusion of low carbon technologies. So thank you very much. And look forward to the discussions. Thank you, Brendan, for the presentation, taking us on a deep dive into progressive climate action planning and the state of. We're going to transition now to Yekan Ko's presentation, where she's going to talk um, more about case studies of conflicts of greens and renewable energy landscapes and what can be done to overcome that. Thank you, Brandon, for your great overview on the subnational climate actions toward energy transition and why we need to accelerate decarbonization to address climate emergency that we are facing. In order to achieve significant cuts in greenhouse gas emissions through energy transition, large scale deployment of renewable energy resources are inevitable. In my presentation, I like to discuss some of the land use challenges around the large scale renewable energy development and explore potential solutions through the cases and lessons from the past decade. All forms of energy development, including fossil fuel or renewables, have land use impacts on ecosystems and communities. In recent years, major land use change across the world have been driven by the growth of renewable energy as more decarbonization targets and institutional mandates invite opportunities for renewable energy development. A recent study from Princeton University reported that the footprint of the solar and wind farms necessary to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 in the US could be more than 1 million square kilometers. So this tells us the spatial impact of renewable energy deployments would become significant in the next few decades. Okay, then why do we need that much space? The spatial footprint of energy development and landscape impacts are closely related to land use intensity or energy density. 
basically how much land areas are required to generate a unit energy. So here, this graph is from one of the early studies that estimated the land use impacts of various energy production and conservation techniques. So this graph shows uh, to the top, the biofuels and biomass have, have the far highest land use intensity, for example. And per unit energy, renewable energy like biofuel, biomass, and wind and solar gener uh, generally have a greater direct footprint and landscape impact than the extracted energy like a coal and natural gas. And the graph shows a negative values for energy efficiency techniques at the bottom, which means if you save energy, then you save land. So highlighting the importance of energy efficiency as the priority action. And a transition from extractive resources like fossil fuel to renewable energy resources like solar and wind on land and ocean surfaces are further transforming our landscapes and bringing conflicts uh, with uh, our wild habit wildlife habitats and communities and so-called green and green conflicts. In 2017, an exciting group of researchers and designers and planners and a landscape ecologist were gathered in Portland, Oregon to discuss what we can learn from these conflicts of greens across the Pacific Rim to accelerate the energy transition to address the climate emergency while generating local value for communities and conserve critical ecosystems. And many of these people in the picture are the co-authors of our upcoming handbook chapter that I'm currently sharing in this presentation. So we have our moderator, Makena Kaufman, and Xiao Wen uh, Huang, our next speaker, and uh, Dustin Mulvaney from San Jose State University, and uh, uh, Andrea Kopping from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So we looked at seven case studies from Japan, California, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Taiwan, and South Korea for their utility scale solar, wind, and offshore wind, and tidal barrage projects, and draw lessons that could inform future planning and policy. So today, I'd like to briefly share two case studies in this presentation among these seven case studies in the book chapter. So the first green on green conflict that I have encountered from, um, was from the Incheon Tidal Power Station, the world's largest tidal power barrage proposals from South Korea in 2005. And there was a fierce debate um, around the plans and particularly their impacts on marine ecosystems, especially around the national heritage site and the endangered species habitat. And following seven years of controversy, in October 2012, the project proposal was turned down. So the Incheon Tidal Power case showed the importance of early public engagement and also how, how it is important to um, have an, an appropriate scale of development with low impact technology. And also the region had a century long history of extensive land filling for development. So landscape scale cumulative assessments incorporating ecological and social values of the region is critical to avoid irreversible impacts from the previous and proposed projects. And another case study uh, is from the Kahoku Wind Power, uh, Ohau, Hawaii, that uh, McKenna Kaufman researched. And the state of Hawaii set a really ambitious goal for 40% of net sales of electricity to be renewable by 2030 and 100% by 2045. So Ohau has a great potential of wind and solar resources, but have fairly limited land available um, as um, you know, the most populated island with nearly uh, 1 million people. And two wind farms were proposed in Kaoku, um, a rural neighborhood on the northeastern shore of Oahu. The first 30 megawatt uh, project was built in 2011, and the second one, uh, the 24 megawatt project, was contentious contentiously constructed in 2020. The key issues around these two wind farms were they were very close to residents, uh, as you see in the picture. And also, uh, yeah, in the, this, the picture is basically the neighborhood schools. And also the Hawaiian 
uh, hoary bat, the only native land mammal and endangered and culturally significant species, was another key concern. So there were um, overall limited knowledge and data about the actual population of the Hawaiian hoary bat and a way to increase the population as well. And usually the timeline of this project often doesn't allow the in-depth research for mitigation. The case of the multiple uh, wind projects in a single rural community in Oahu Kauku show the both concerns of energy justice and the challenges of uh, adaptive management for threatened species. So these case studies uh, demonstrated how much ecological and social costs are paid when conservation and social goals are not considered at, at an early stage nor uh, adequately researched and monitored. So from this, we identified uh, three main attributes of uh, optimal, optimal seeding of large scale renewable energy. So in this table, uh, the first attribute is having a robust and transparent public process and engaging multi-sectoral leadership and a common uh, goal setting and consensus building which I'd like to uh, elaborate a little more uh, with an example uh, shortly after. And the second attribute uh, is uh, conducting independent and in-depth uh, pre-construction data analysis on species, habitats, and the potential interactions and mitigations at landscape level. And the third, uh, continued um, species and uh, site monitoring for the purpose of mitigation and adaptive management. In broad terms, uh, these are no different from accepted best practices from planning of any, any large infrastructure, basically. So there are several examples of least conflict approaches and guidelines. Um, I'd like to highlight a little more about the, the importance of early and proactive public participation in a seeding process. Um, which uh, really determines uh, that the project needs uh, more or less opposition. So the least conflicts of the development mapping in San Joaquin Valley, California is a great example of landscape scale spatial planning through extensive multi-stakeholder engagement. And San Joaquin Valley is known for extremely high agriculture value, growing urbanization, and high conservation value for over 20 endangered and threatened species. And the project team held a separate meetings with each stakeholder group to identify suitable and unsuitable land and produce a composite least conflict areas map. The process yielded over 400,000 acres of the region, which is about 5% as the land appropriate for development or considered low conflict. So next presentation from Xiao Wen Wang uh, will shared an additional, um, another excellent example of a similar least conflict approach from Taiwan. And lastly, to protect critical habitats and prime farmlands, we should prioritize the sharing of land uses. So energy production can be co-located with various land uses, for example, other grazing and farmland, dairy and animal farms, pollinator planters and beehive and water infrastructure like irrigation canals or reservoirs. And these co-locations provide various co-benefits uh, like increasing the productivity of the land, and increasing revenue generation, enhancing ecosystem services, and biodiversity, and reducing management costs, and cooling down the site, and reducing evaporation from the water resources. And obviously, uh, more renewable energy on urban area could be an excellent co-location strategy to generate energy near where the demands are, which uh, Kirk Demand will explore, explore further in the later presentation. Lastly, uh, this recent article that I co-wrote with uh, Nick Pabsner and Kirk Demand for Landscape Architecture Magazine uh, calls for designers and planners to advance bold and exciting visions for the new decarbonizing landscapes at appropriate scales. Thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to the vibrant discussions at the end. Thank you.
Thank you, Ya Kang, for presenting our work on case studies of um, conflict of greens across the Pacific Rim. And we're gonna um, move to Xiaowen Wang's uh, presentation where she's gonna take us into a um, specific example uh, in her work in Taiwan. Get that going. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Xiaowen Wang from National Chenggong University. Today, I'm very glad to join all of you for the webinar and the discussion. So uh, after Brenda's very uh, comprehensive overview and Yagan's clear introduction of conflicts for greens, uh, I'm now going to talk a little bit more about the experiences from Taiwan and the lessons we learned. So uh, in Taiwan, uh, in realizing that uh, it is vital to have the green energy to reduce the greenhouse gases and as well as to address the risk of nuclear. In 2016, uh, we had very ambitious goal that we aim at phasing out the nuclear energy by 2025, and also 20% of the energy should be from uh, renewables, uh, which means that in terms of solar energy, we will need to have another 19 gigawatt of solar uh, in nine years. So this 20 gigawatt uh, include like expansion of ground mounted solar energy distribution infrastructure, uh, solar on uh, industrial parks, as well as the amendments of laws and regulations related to solar development. But as of uh, the 2021, uh, there was only, well, a little bit more than seven gigawatt of installed solar capacity making this goal very, very ambitious. So uh, when the 20 gigawatt goal was made in 2006, uh, 2016, uh, it was hoped that uh, three gigawatt of rooftop solar uh, with another 70 gigawatt of ut utility scale solar. But because of the uh, large scale renewable energy development expense, more land use conflicts are actually arising. So uh, there were like a two times amendments so in 2021, uh, we actually had the rooftop solar go re uh, increase to 8 gigawatt. So with the utility scale go decrease to 12 gigawatt from the 17 gigawatt. But still, uh, well, the goals of the uh, 12 gigawatt of installed solar capacity uh, was not like uh, decided upon based on any land availability or the uh, estimate for the entire country. So uh, while we are facing this uh, very ambitious goal, and also in Taiwan, the land availability is quite limited. So the comfortable greens in Taiwan is uh, way more difficult. So uh, there are two main types of the conflicts in Taiwan. So uh, the first main type is that, um, well, uh, in locations where the utility solar energy was proposed on the wetland habitats. So as you see from this slide, in the southwest and coast of Taiwan, uh, there are like beautiful and abundant resources, wetlands, uh, but many of the solars, uh, utility scale solars, were proposed to just build next to these wetlands. So, for instance, in the uh, Budai Sopen wetland, uh, there was actually the discussion on uh, expanding the, the wetland boundary, but the discussion was stopped uh, and the, the expansion was canceled in 2017 for the solar development to be possible, as you see here. And actually in 2018, an 80 hectare uh, piece of black-faced windmill habitat was designated as the utility scale solar and it was uh, installed just a year after. So one other type of these conflicts are uh, mainly in the locations uh, where the mixed-use solar developments were proposed for on the aquaculture lane. So the socioeconomic conflicts were related to the fish farmers' livelihoods, while the ability of the fish farmers to conduct the normal operations with the solar installations and to continue working if the fish, fish ponds were rented to the solar companies instead. So in general, we see lack of communication, uh, mistrust, and fear of losing livelihoods led to the protest and sometimes anger towards the re uh, renewable energy in general. So uh, the questions we are uh, posing to ourselves, with this very limited uh, availability of land, what land does Taiwan have for us to work with? So if we don't have, we don't consider like the high mountain in the central, and if we uh, pretty much um, focus on the west of Taiwan, so what exactly the land does Taiwan have? 
So we were trying to understand, well, the, the complicated relationships between the stakeholders. So we learned that uh, for such a large scale special planning, uh, lack of participatory planning contributes to the occurrence of conflicts. So with the uh, solar companies are actually required uh, to host the comp uh, community meetings to announce their plans in Taiwan, but there's actually very little to no inclusion of local stakeholders in the siting and the design processes. So the local knowledges are uh, very little to be considered. So, uh, well, in response to this uh, growing land issue problems, so uh, we develop a participatory lease concrete solar siting framework, uh, which uses the place-based stakeholder engagement uh, paired with the analytical hierarchy process and geographic information system based on the uh, multi-criteria decision-making to try to identify the suitable solar development sites. So we try to argue that the finding the suitable locations directly affects not just the cost and benefit uh, and efficiency, uh, but also the social impacts, the environmental impacts, as well as the public opinion of the renewable energy development as well should also be considered. And we, well, after we develop, develop this framework, uh, we also use a demonstration site to, to uh, explain how this framework can be used. But basically in this framework, you see uh, this is a five-step framework. Uh, so in the first step, we argue that the information gathering from the stakeholder communication, case study uh, review and literature review are very important. So this framework uh, directs the researchers and decision makers to communicate with the stakeholders to gain an overall understanding of what factors need to be considered when looking at a specific region and what kind of the data is available for that region. So in our demonstration side, uh, we participated in uh, numerous public meetings and government-led uh, meetings. And also we conducted the interviews with the uh, village leaders and locals. And also we organized the different workshops to bring the stakeholders together. In the step two, uh, which is the analyze stakeholder information. Uh, we use the AHP to prioritize which factors uh, should be uh, weighed uh, more than the others. And then uh, in the third step, which is the GIS mapping. So uh, we conduct the suitability mapping basically and using the weights identified in the AHP. And after the three steps, uh, we will have a range of possible lease conflict locations. But the very important is the, uh, the following step, which is the site evaluation, because we want to specifically look at uh, the three aspects, including the socioeconomy and legal aspect, energy efficiency aspect, as well as the environmental uh, aspect. So we want to find out if there are any special human or ecological uses of the land not reflect in the mapping data and uh, which the solar developers uh, should be aware of or, or should have any like accommodating plans and so on. And after these five steps, uh, we can say uh, our, our uh, locations could be uh, the truly least conflict. And in our demonstration site, uh, we focus on the, um, well, the Southwest Taiwan, uh, the, the Jiayi County and the Tainan City. And in Taiwan, uh, we actually have the uh, different land use types uh, with uh, varying build rates, uh, laws or restrictions. So with that in mind, so we have uh, the uh, install capacity, if only like 10%, 30% or 50% uh, of the suitable land can be developed with solar. But here on your right, you see the suitable, uh, suitability mapping uh, that we came up after the three steps of the framework. So the greener or the higher uh, score, uh, the higher suitability the land is, but with the different percentage uh, of uh, how much land can be developed, uh, we came up that, um, well, if only 12% of the land with medium to high suitability are developed with solar energy generation, the Tainan city and, and the Jiayi County actually alone could support the government's solar development goal for the entirety of Taiwan by 2025 without sacrificing much critical habitat. But remember that um, we focus our framework both top down and bottom up. So remember that in our uh, step four, which is the site evaluation. So uh, if we use this uh, Bu Dai Sopan uh, that I mentioned briefly uh, in the first type of conflicts, 
So as an examination, so we see that, uh, well, not only uh, these areas, which are the legally protected wetland, have the very low suitability, we see that in the four pieces of the lens here show, well, uh, relatively low suitability. But it becomes very apparent that some of these solpins are just as much environmental and social economy importance as this protected wetlands. Because according to the endemic species research institutions data, so these, uh, for instance, the A solpin in particular was an important ha habitat for the endangered black faced spoonbill. So with about 8% of the entire world population found to use this 80 hectare SOPAM in 2016 before the solar de development occurred. And also in addition, uh, through our different interviews and discussions with the local villages, we found that these supports uh, various ecosystem uh, services to the nearby villages. So due to these considerations, so even, well, these suitability analysis assign them positive suitability, but these opens do not seem to be suitable for utility scale solar development at all. So with this uh, demonstration, so we further have a few lessons we learned. So uh, we suggest uh, this framework can be used to address the special mismatch between, well, the national level policy and local implementation. So because environmental planning, we consider as a, a critical bridge between policy and implementation. And then the participatory approach to support the place-based renewable energy co-location, well, as Yaka mentioned in her presentation, but the co-locating solar energy with other land uses to increase the land use efficiency uh, might be important, but it doesn't mean there is no conflict. So that's why the place-based um, planning and uh, based on the participation is very important. And also policy and regulations are important to support the just transition. So uh, the sharing of the work are actually submitted to uh, the Renewable Energy uh, Journal for consideration now. So hopefully we will have the, uh, well, the approved uh, manuscript uh, to share with you all. But just one last note that last year in Taiwan, uh, we had a declaration of net zero in 2015. So with the lessons we learned from the renewable energy development, we are now adopting uh, the integrated resources planning, hopefully in a way that we can come up with the clearer and detailed roadmaps to uh, achieve the goal in uh, net zero 2050. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to the discussions later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shawan, for the really great presentation on the spatial mismatches between renewable energy policy and implementation and uh, some ways to overcome that. Let me, um, we're gonna turn to Kirk's presentation next, uh, who will be giving very specific examples of uh, solar design principles and co-location principles. My name is Kirk Diamond. I'm an assistant professor of landscape architecture at the University of Arizona, and I'm going to be speaking on site design with solar PV in the urban boundary. Despite continued significant growth in solar PV, it accounts for just over 3% of global electricity and requires a five-fold increase in annual deployment between now and 2030 to stay on track for a net zero scenario by 2050. With that kind of continued growth, land use pressures must be addressed. Particularly relevant as an opportunity to avoid many of the green on green conflicts is integration into urban lands. Solar PV is different from many technologies because the modularity and the inherent safety make it conducive to being near users, such as on our houses, uh, however, to avoid similar conflicts we've seen in rural applications of PV systems, PV systems in urban spaces should be well planned and designed to enhance the quality of place. I'm going to be discussing a few common site design strategies, applicable design principles, and some synergies and trade-offs when considering site design with PV in the urban environment specifically. So I've focused on three main types of urban integration, uh, including building adopted PV, canopy mounted PV, and ground mounted PV. 
And the idea here is to use affordable systems but avoid utility-like separation, such as seen in this photo with a fenced off singular use area with the site cleared just with the purpose of solar PV. This also as an example of what to avoid, uh, you know, the idea of out of sight, out of mind. Uh, the efforts are to embrace this technology as part of our urban infrastructure. So the opportunities with the types I'm looking at, uh, first is building adopted uh, photovoltaics. This is the idea of integrating PV without modifying the existing structure. So distinct from building integrated PV or BIPV, um, this would be a more affordable solution. And really there's a lot of potential with the rooftops covering our, our vast cities. Um, they're under, underutilized surfaces. Not all of them are suitable, but uh, many of them can be and don't have a significant impact on aesthetics in, in most cases. But as we continue toward decarbonization goals, it may be more and more necessary to adapt PV to facades as well, which would have greater impacts on aesthetics. Canopy-mounted PV is distinguished in that it allows access underneath the panels. So there's a lot of potential for this in our urban environment. Sun protection, potential for rain protection even, um, creates microclimates, extends uses and, and growing seasons. Uh, and it's also effective in spanning things such as parking lots. Ground-mounted systems that utilize ground plane surfaces such as detention basins, easements, brownfields, and other type of landscapes that creates more efficiency for the land use and avoids displacing other types of developments. So as we fill our landscape with this infrastructure, it's important to hold on to basic design principles that can be subtle or significant, but can make a difference in acceptability and pride. So design principles have a clear relationship to PV. So I've identified four design principles that have a clear relationship to PV, starting out first with repetition or repeating an element through a site. So repetition is inherent to PV with regard to cells, pan panels, and arrays, um, but there's risks of mon monotony in larger systems. But uh, perceivable alternations can maintain visual interest among the, the repetition. So this example at the University of Buffalo is by Walter Hood. It demonstrates the strong repetition al along this corridor, but alterations in the array arrangements provides visual interest among the 5,000 modules that make up the system. Second design principle is unity, and making a whole in that sense can be seen in this project, wh uh, whether it's intentional or not. So this is a rooftop application with visibility from nearby structures. The dark horizontal form peeking above the parapet repeats the horizontal contrast of the windows against the brick to fit the original architecture. Contrast can be good if it contributes to unity, but too much contrast, such as what's seen when PV is put into natural or rural settings, is where there can be more conflicts. Unity is easier to achieve in an architectural environment with the prevailing rectilinear and non-organic forms. Next, proportion. Proportion is defined as the comparative, proper, or harmonious relation of one part to another or the whole with respect to magnitude, quantity, or degree. Achieving a relatable scale for people nearby or under a PV system is important. A variety of sizes can be implemented across the urban landscape. Speed and distance may allow for larger systems where the human experience is less connected. Other factors such as density and height become more important with proximity to the uses. In this case, a more intimate system spans an outdoor break area for an office building. 
proportioned to the human scale, the semi-transparent overhead array plane is not at the top of the heavy brick wall, but securely affixed at a lower height, giving a proportioned spatial arrangement appropriate to the uses. Fourth principle order is a condition of logical, harmonious, or com comprehensible arrangements in which each element of a group is properly disposed with reference to other elements and to its purpose. The simplistic forms of PV modules can be manipulated to be harmonious with a variety of organizational patterns. Balance achieved in the layout of this parking lot is reinforced by the curving pattern of the quadratic arrays to assist with orientation toward the principal walking path. So order is achieved in referencing the existing forms as well as the purpose of those forms. As an illustration of the importance of using design principles such as these in the implementation of urban PV, we have an example here of good intentions to shade a parking lot. At first glance, it may seem to work well. Being in the northern hemisphere, it has a south orientation for the array. It uniformly repeats itself somewhat proportional to the site in use. However, the positioning of the posts presents a hazard for the shared use. Reordering the structure to unify with the site and function would posit the treeless landscape island as an opportunity to support the infrastructure, or at the very least along the center line between the stacks of parking spaces. This does challenge the efficiency of the system with either a change in orientation or more infrastructure for a taller post at one edge, but it would remove the immediate hazard for vehicles and potentially shade more spaces. As is, it may foster less than positive attitudes to solar covered parking and potentially require consequential energy use in the repair of vehicles and for the structure itself. The fact of the matter is that there are potential trade-offs in integrating solar PV into the urban environment, one of the primary being the reduced generation efficiencies and greater infrastructure costs. However, focusing on the synergistic strategies through design and strategic implementation can help us make best use of the inherent form, materials, safety, and scalability of solar PV. Design principles such as repetition, unity, proportion, and order among BAPV, canopy mounted, and ground mounted PV in the urban environment can keep costs low while deindustrializing this energy infrastructure. With the exponential growth in PV needed and anticipated, urban integration in this way is crucial to help mitigate the need for so many large decentralized and remote solar farms that threaten natural habitat, farmland, and other open spaces vulnerable to development as the clean energy demand continues. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk, for the great presentation walking us through uh, best practices and design principles. Uh, with that, I want to invite our four panelists all on screen. I see you're here. Um, and let's get a few questions in. I want to remind our audience to please put your, um, your questions into the chat. Uh, let me, I'll monitor the Q&A too, but I request that if you could use the chat, that way we'd keep it all into one place. That would be great. Um, let me start with, I think a question uh, most relevant to Ya Kang and Xiao Wen. So with you know, the urgency of the climate crisis and the urgency of response needed that Brendan described, um, how can governments both respond to the needs of rapid renewable energy deployment, as well as make it mitigating land use uh, and ecological conflicts. You both sort of gave these case studies, but I want to ask you a little bit about the timeframes a little bit more, right? Ya Kang, you said that in many ways, these best practices for renewable energy planning are like any infrastructure planning. How do we think about um, urgency with, within that dynamic? Yeah, thank you, Makena. I, I think, um, yeah, 
I can emphasize more, you know, how urgent we are now to address climate change. And because of that urgency, I think a lot of governments try to um, make a really large development in a top-down uh, way, top-down approach. So um, I think that has been causing a lot of you know, conflict around you know, ecosystems and communities. Um, so as we saw from the Xiaowen's um, case study from Taiwan, the Taiwanese government naturally, <laughs> they increased the rooftop solar PV over time because of the conflicts around the utility scale um, energy development. So that really proves the importance of prioritizing our um, renewable energy on the already developed land, like uh, urban areas, like uh, obviously rooftops. And uh, we have so many like parking lots and the big box retail rooftops. And there are so many areas that, you know, and as we saw from the Kirk's presentation, so many opportunities in those urban and suburban areas. So I think that you know, prioritizing that would be a great uh, first step. But still, the large scale deployment uh, should be, you know, it will be inevitable because to achieve the scale of the renewable energy that we need to generate to meet our goals. So in that case, I think we need to really make sure that the local communities get the benefits of the renewable energy facilities and infrastructures. A lot of the conflicts coming around because of the, the a lot of the energy that they're generating from these wind farms and solar farms are going some air, somewhere. So the, the local communities don't really get the direct benefit from it. So, so I think it's really important to make sure that local community gets uh, the direct benefits like a revenue generation or like tax revenue directly support the local infrastructures and schools. So really make help the other communities better. Yeah, so I think that would be really important. And um, lastly, uh, but most importantly, I think a lot of the, I think we need to really put um, energy justice uh, up front to, to really um, make it, um, um, you know, justice, like a just transition. Um, so often, you know, we think about justice in the like last minute, <laughs> but that's too late many times. And so we need to really make sure that we are addressing these like three pillars of justice, for example, like a uh, distributional justice with, uh, where like uh, all this, um, both burn up, uh, burden and the benefits of the uh, new energy infrastructure equally shared, equally distributed. And then, you know, obviously the procedural justice, you know, how the decision make, making process can be more participatory and accessible to all, as we have seen from the Taiwan case study. And also re, um, the recognition of justice, how the voices and values from the uh, local and especially like marginalized communities are represented in the uh, process. Yeah, so well, thanks, McKenna, for your question. And I, I just can't agree with Yeka more. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, more in, uh, in a situation in Taiwan, uh, because the land use in Taiwan is highly intense. So for, for some of you um, have visited Taiwan, so you know that uh, we, we might have the wetlands just right next to the agricultural areas in, in the city, uh, well, in town. Uh, so the very intensive like land use in Taiwan also make our land use regulations highly complicated. So for instance, the Southwestern Taiwan that I share in the presentation, well, uh, there are like a different regulations, um, for instance, like the Coastal Planning Act, Rural Land Use Act, and we have the Wedding Act and National Special Planning Act. So a site have to be uh, fulfilling the various land use requirements, uh, which is very difficult. Well, uh, originally, uh, it's a way that ensuring that uh, the environmental and social expectations can be met in the legal aspects. But, but still, in reality, it pretty much creates a very complicated environment for the public, investors, and, and policymakers to navigate the plan for renewable energy growth. So that's why So we see the amendment of the goals, uh, but we do see the mentality of low-hanging fruits so if we want to address uh, and to, to kind of like a pretty much um, have the um, uh, like, a, well, quick enough, 
to meet the need of the, the renewable energy deployment, we have to deal with the uh, land use issues. Uh, so that's why like the proper siting strategies are very critical. Uh, as I briefly shared the least conflict siting framework that we try to develop. But one uh, very important thing that I want to add here, uh, which was not addressed much in the presentation uh, is the integrated resources planning. So we understand that, uh, well, it's not only about land use, it's also about, well, the supply demand resources. So how can we like uh, all together identify the different resources of the whole grid and the energy intensive sectors? I think with that, uh, this could only give us a real goal of the renew renewable energy supported by the data and models rather than just a random 20 gigawatt, but some numbers that could based on some solid understanding of the big picture of the portfolio and the environmental capacity. So I think that's what I would like to address. Thank you. Thanks, Yukang. Thanks, Xiaowen. Um, I want to ask Brendan or Kirk if you have anything to add to this kind of comment about urgency and how do we match the urgency and scale of the problem with also being careful and doing it right up front. Um, anything to yeah, add? Thank you, McKenna. Um, so I actually feel like we have the tools to do this. The problem is that we're not necessarily orientated towards that. Um, so for instance, I really agree with the idea, uh, Xiao Wang's idea of this integrated resource planning. And then I think that should be tied into uh, strategic environmental assessment. So you have your national integrated, integrated plan and an SEA on that. And then you have your subnational integrated plan and SCA on that. And then you get down to the project level and then you've got environmental impact assessment. So the tools are there. Um, but I think that the challenge we have is that generally we perceive as something like SEA or EIA um, uh, environmental designers slowing down the process because they have pr procedures that you add on. But I actually believe that it does, um, it, it has the opposite effect because essentially what we might see is that conflict is reduced by greater clarity at the different levels there. So that's the big hope is that we can actually accelerate through better planning and better design. And that's why I like Kirk's presentation on, on the design aspect as well at the site level. And I think at all those, at all those stages, it's really, really important to have um, you know, community engagement. And I think that's uh, something that uh, is coming up in all the different presentations. And I think it's about, again, not seeing these tools like SEA, EIA as, as dragging the process or slowing it down. I'm not seeing public consultation and the engagement as having that effect, but actually trying to uh, design and implement them in a way that it accelerates this, uh, this process. There. So I think good planning, whether it's integrated resource planning, integrated energy, land use planning and so on, is really, really key. The problem is that maybe it's not happening <laughs> enough, um, and that's slightly worrying. Thanks, Brendan. That's a really important point. I, in my mind, it's also about the durability of it, right? Sort of not just the speed, but also how long are these solutions going to be, you know, durable within the public realm? Um, and we're also getting a bunch of really good questions into the chat. So thank you uh, for adding this. And a couple are, are, for, are for you, Kirk. So I'm gonna put, put this together. Um, Audrey Newman, thanks for tuning in, Audrey from Olakai. Is there a significant cost differential between utility scale solar and open land and rooftop or urban solar? Um, and that is similar to the next question. So I'll put them together. Is there a benefit to solar farms versus decentralized or fragment solar, fragmented solar throughout a city in terms of efficiency and storage? Yeah, great questions. Thank you so much for, for those. Um, so there is a, a cost difference and it is a challenge, a barrier to overcome. And, uh, um, you know, utility scale and open land you know, it's economy of scale, essentially easy to implement re repetitively across the, the landscape in that sense, cheaper land and so forth. But I think the, the important part about the, the urban application is uh, strategizing with 
some of those synergistic uses. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm in the southwestern United States, uh, arid, very sun-soaked uh, part of the country, and shade is is huge, and, and there's a lot of shade infrastructure going up. And so by offsetting the cost of just like shade canopies uh, that don't produce energy and making that more productive in that sense can can be a, a bit of a cost saving a synergy that makes the, the investment more uh, affordable compared to the the decentralized uh, large solar farms but i i think even then it, it we may need to uh, take a look at our our energy pricing you know if we're looking at a an urban system the cost per kilowatt hour there versus uh, a, a large farm it's it's going to register as more expensive financially but if if you factor in the social benefits of having that shade for the users and so forth there's um, a, a different calculation necessary to to show that it is a comparable uh, price if well designed and so forth um, as far as the second question, Lucas, with uh, uh, solar farms versus the decentralized or fragmented solar throughout the city, um, you know, I, I think efficiency wise, there is a benefit in the sense that it's close to the user. In, in most urban applications, it would be more of a commercial scale or residential scale application where the, the energy is being put into the, the building right there. Um, you know, there, there is the net um, calculations to benefit some of the, the nearby portions of the grid, but, um, you know, there's, there's not gonna be those losses over the long transmission. Um, but even then again, it, it, it can be a hard sell, especially if it is, a, a single use system in the urban environment. So uh, again, the emphasis should be on that co-location, the, the synergies that are produced. And I think, uh, you know, that kind of reminds me of some interesting opportunities. Uh, you know, one, one thing here locally in, in Tucson, Arizona, that we're seeing is a lot of schoolyards are introducing solar. And I, I intend to look further into it, but I'm imagining with that single client and single contractor spread throughout the, the municipality. Uh, it, talking about Tucson Unified School District is a, a very large school district, a lot of property. I believe they were able to get uh, a, a pricing model that is going to be a little more comparable to a, a centralized type of setup. Uh, so, you know, just those soft costs are, are really a challenge in the urban environment. And so finding ways like a single owner across a, a lot of land in the city can help reduce some of those soft costs, the approval processes and the contracting and everything associated. Um, so I think I think there is a, a barrier to, to overcome there, but there are some strategies out there to make it more competitive in some ways. But like Ye Kong said earlier that, uh, these remote systems aren't going away. They're still part of the, the solution, but subsidizing that a bit, you know, re mitigating the, the need for so many and, uh, you know, really utilizing all the surfaces we can in the urban environment, integrating it nicely uh, can be a benefit to, to help uh, preserve some of the, those vulnerable properties. Thanks, Kirk. We have a, a technology availability question from um, my colleague Kavika Winters. So he's asking regarding green versus green conflicts, the horizontal axis wind turbines here in Hawaii have resulted in hundreds of take or kills of endangered birds and bats. When the developers are questioned about the ability to switch to vertical axis wind turbines that are less of a threat to endangered species, their standard act answer is that the vertical axis wind turbines are not yet at a commercial scale. Is this true? Uh, it seems more like an excuse because they're not as energy efficient and would make the developer less money in their power use agreements. So the reality is more that they are disincentivized to explore it rather than it, than it being an issue with the technology. What do you think? If you folks have good examples of large scale vertical access wind turbines, that would be great to know. Have you, any of you encountered large scale vertical wind access turbines? I've only seen them on small scale personally. What about you all? OK, 
Okay, I'm gonna take silence as nobody has good examples, Kavika. Um, and want to uh, keep asking uh, participants to put your questions into the chat. These are great, thank you. Um, from William Lean, local governments usually have a lot to say in conducting design review, setting design standard, executing community communication and participation. Could this be the, the next big agenda, pushing local governments into setting pathways, roadmaps, and standards? Brendan, I think I'm going to ask you to respond to this first, and we'll, then we'll open it up. Uh, absolutely, William. That's spot on what local government should be doing, and that's what I was covering in my presentation. But uh, we also have to recognize that not all local government is created equal, that uh, in some instances, local government is purely about providing basic services, whether that's um, you know, waste management or cleaning the highways and so on and and they don't necessarily have the technical capabilities to uh, develop these um, these detailed pathways roadmaps and standards so there's a question there about how to strengthen local governments so that they can take forward this kind of um, detailed energy and uh, decarbonization planning and then also their ability to work with other stakeholders in the in the local community is, is uh, really really important as well. And then there's an, I think the next question is actually where these sit within uh, local governments. So in many instances, something like climate action is within the environmental unit, and then they struggle to get collaboration from other departments across local government. So I actually believe that sort of mainstreaming uh, climate action and decarbonization, et cetera, is really important for local governments, but that doesn't seem to be happening right now. So I'm really thinking that that's a, that has to be a priority so that your climate action plan actually drives a lot of local government activity and then maybe the final point is that energy often sits out of look outside of local government uh, it didn't used to but um, over time became privatized and so local governments have limited say in how energy policies are implemented within their boundaries and i think that's where sort of the emergence of local governments to either taking con control over energy um, policy or even setting up their own municipal energy uh, companies is a really important step forward and that's we're seeing that increasingly happen there's good examples even here in japan uh, hamamatsu city has a very uh, has its own power company so i think this and, and if that's not possible then it's basically about developing closer collaborative relationships with the energy utilities and trying to shape what they do as well so I think there are a few, I think it's vitally important that we develop these pathways, but I think it's also quite challenging under the current circumstances. Brendan, can I ask you a follow-up question? Sure. So, uh, in, your, in your deep dive into local climate action planning, how do you see these municipal efforts um, influencing national efforts? Or vice versa, but I'm particularly interested in how in sort of the bottom up or bottom up uh, mechanisms. Yeah, I think the two are uh, intimately uh, connected, and I think you need really clear national policies in order to drive forward change at the local government. We saw that in in Japan when the Japanese government committed to net zero. Suddenly, all the local governments went net zero as a, their main target. But the the beauty of work bottom-up approaches is the diversity that you can see in terms of responses and uh, the rapid learning that can take place so maybe whereas Oslo will adopt one approach Copenhagen will have another and I think what we want to see then is interaction between those and I think that interaction is where the acceleration can take place so um, we can learn from Leeds we can learn from uh, you know, the Australian capital territory, we can learn from Fukushima, and the more sharing we can see at the subnational level, the more likely it is that this sort of innovation cycle will, will increase there. So, I mean, actually, I mean, I'm, I criticize the net zero 2050 target as being too far away, but I'm hoping that even, with, even if we're stuck with that, that we can actually have rapid um, innovation at the local level just by the diversity of responses that will emerge there. 
Xiaowen, I, I see you nodding and I'm wondering if you have anything to add to that, particularly with the kind of case study of Taiwan and um, renewable energy planning there. Yeah, so, um, well, again, um, uh, um, the net zero is very challenging and it's ambitious. So uh, it's like uh, everybody should take action. But uh, again, like the, the issue is the challenges uh, if, uh, well, the local government have the technical capability or the, the locals are really be engaged in the processes or uh, something like that. Uh, so I would say it's, um, well, a process that we uh, learn from different practices and from each other. So, uh, well, uh, Taiwan is still in a very like a learning stage. And uh, in a national level, um, last year, uh, we formed uh, so-called like the, the cross ministry uh, working groups to deal with different aspects uh, of the uh, decarbonization. Uh, but still, uh, that's mainly in the uh, ministry level, the uh, central government. So the local governments, um, for sure now, they, they have the, the pressure, but, but they still don't know how to do it. So um, hopefully that, uh, well, through all this sharing and lessons, um, yeah, we can learn on the way, yeah, and improve ourselves. Thanks. There is a comment from Christina Schlon Schlonlieber um, in the chat uh, asking if there are any papers that speakers can share or recommend um, from what's been presented. And I'll, I'll say, Christina, there is a handbook coming out in February of which these presentations are based. Um, and it'll be available February 23rd via Rutledge as part of the APRU Sustainable Cities and Landscapes Hub um, working groups. So I'd encourage you to check that out, but I know there are other papers that our speakers uh, were drawing from. So maybe if people can uh, stick citations in the chat, um, make that available at the end, that would be great. And I wanna ask a follow-up question. Um, Particularly something you said, Yu Kang, but I think also relevant to, to your presentation, Xiaowen. It's you, you talked about distributional justice, Yu Kang, and how important it is in this transition, and particularly that it needs to be, you know, there needs to be some distribution amongst communities as they experience the, the land use transition and the impacts. Um, community benefits packages are typically the way, the mechanism with which that's been brokered. And I'm wondering if you have any comments on how you think how you think they're working, whether you think they are getting to these um, distributional 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 justice issues um, that you discussed. And for Xiao Wen, you know, you described there was a lot of um, concern about transitions related to livelihoods. And I'm wondering if this, if these kinds of community benefits packages play a role, and if so, successfully or not. Yeah, uh, great question. So, yeah, I think the distributional justice uh, can also have various scales. So first, whether the the benefit is going directly to the community, and even like after that among community, how this um, you know, public revenue can be well distributed among the community. And there are community groups that are more impacted by the renewable energy facility than the other. Some of the like a tribal group, tri tribe groups, or like some uh, communities that are right adjacent to the new facility and things like that. So I think, um, so first, step is bringing the bring the benefit to the community and then thinking about how we uh, distribute them uh, spatially but also uh, really the 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 communities that are directly impacted by this um, so so for example like um, so Oregon uh, rural communities have a lot of like wind farms these days and then the recent report uh, says that um, about like 120 million uh, direct tax revenue over the past four years uh, went to the Oregon rural, rural communities from the wind project. And um, I, um, as far as I heard, uh, uh, a lot of these counties, like for example, like Sherman County, and they, they were able to use this uh, fund to support their local schools. And so the, the there are more like positive um, uh, reception of the renewable energy and, um, and uh, trying to make it as a lesson for the other communities. And um, yeah, so 
for the and Oregon also has this uh, Oregon coast, which uh, also is a potential uh, site for the um, the ocean energy development. And also, so there is a, like a potential conflicts around there. And um, so we are trying to like learn how the, this wind project can teach the ocean energy, uh, the coastal communities, and how we can really have that distribution justice component into ocean, yeah. Ocean energy, yeah. Uh, well, so thanks, uh, McKenna, for the great question. So um, uh, we, we do have a, uh, an example to share here. So just right next to uh, the very controversial uh, large scale uh, utility uh, uh, solar development uh, in the Jiayan, Thailand. So three, uh, two, three years ago, uh, we try to uh, demonstrate how the community can be benefit uh, from all this like a renewable energy development. So um, we were, uh, we started to work on, uh, well, the um, a holding company, Cake Day Holding Company. So because they want to have their CSR, they so, uh, and they also support the uh, scientific supported lease siting framework. So they invest a lot. Uh, to support the rooftop uh, solar development in an aging community just right next to, well, the, the SOPEN uh, solar development. And, and the, the, the revenue and the benefits gained from this uh, renewable energy is actually being used to support the meals, food for the elders. So as I said, this is an aging community. So uh, the, the, the revenues uh, earnings to provide the meals shared by the elders creating an environment um, that uh, the, 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 uh, the elderly can enjoy with their, their friends and so-called so uh, kind of like, a, we call it uh, shared elderly meals. And, and with that, also our uh, local NGOs are being part of it because uh, they also want to contrast this kind of the community scale local development benefiting the locals vs the large scale, very controversial solar and solar development. So the NGOs are uh, play a, a part in monitoring well the environmental changes and so on. So I, I would consider this one of the example that uh, we should highlight more and to in, encourage more practices like this. So. Thanks, Yu Kang. Thanks, Xiaowen. Those are great examples. Um, Kirk, I want to uh, transition to asking a question about, can you think of any, you know, you talked about the design, really good design principles for integrating solar PV within urban spaces and issues of co-location. And I'm wondering if, you know, are these being codified into, you know, municipal development requirements, um, into permitting requirements? Can you think of places that are, are doing this particularly well or on, or on the bleeding edge of, starting to have these kinds of design principles in practice? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think, I think to some extent, this might jump back to, to William's question to some degree uh, as far as design standards go. And I, I think that uh, it's, it's one of those tricky things to balance in the sense that uh, a lot of municipal codes with regards to, to solar, um, they're trying to avoid barriers that increase the costs and, and discourage uh, developers from, from implementing them. And so I, I'd be hesitant to, to really push for like these design principles and so forth to be codified and, and adopted into the, these codes as mandates. But I, I think yeah, definitely as far as guidelines go, um, encouraging uh, more uh, inter interdisciplinary design teams, getting architects and landscape architects involved early on to, to help find those synergies and so forth. Um, you know, I, I, um, there's, there's a bit about height restrictions and uh, uh, different things along that, those lines. And then there's also the balance, you know, small scale versus medium and large scale. Um, you know, I think a lot of places are, maybe putting more restrictions or, or requiring a more thorough design process or a yeah, thorough process of review for medium and large scale systems. But again, when, when considering the costs in the urban environment are already higher, I think, um, you know, 
encouraging it as much as possible and not requiring it is is probably the way to go at this point uh, just to encourage that that urgency right the, the rapid rapid return um so i mean I, I think there's a few places that are putting out uh, some guidelines you see a lot with historic preservation how to work with it in there but i don't think there's enough conversation just yet about ground mounted in the urban environment, looking at uh, those design synergies for, for shade and other things like that. Um, but I, I think having design professionals involved in, in the layouts of that infrastructure can, can be an aid in that process. Thanks, Kirk. Uh, we have one question that came in to Brendan and we are almost at time. So I think Brendan, you will get the last word. Uh, the question is, how or which principles should your suggested evaluation framework be tailored for the deep decarbonization in the context of developing countries where the governance capacity and funding sources are less robust than all developed cities in your analysis? Wow, that's a fantastic question. And uh, I have to um, be very honest and admit that my focus is on the uh, developed cities because I think they're they held uh, primary responsibility for going first and sorting out this challenge before developing country cities, because the fact is that in developing country cities, there are so many other priorities that need to be addressed uh, immediately. Nevertheless, I still think that um, it is important that this consideration is there. And I would actually say that they need to, uh, for instance, uh, issuing their own climate emergency declaration is a good step forward. And then also uh, putting forward proposals for climate action um, and tying that into uh, fiscal and economic measures, such as uh, job generation, dealing with how subsidies work uh, within the city, looking at budgeting. Those are the sorts of things I think that uh, developing country cities could focus on, but I also believe that they need a lot of additional support around implementation. And that's where I think aid programs can play a big part in helping them, say, for instance, focus on renewable uh, energy technologies, looking at the energy supply and demand within the cities and so on and so forth. So I think it's more the planning and policies uh, area that uh, developing country cities could, could make the biggest progress under the current circumstances. But I recognize that they have complex agendas to deal with uh, already. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Um, I really want to thank all of you. This was a really great discussion. And thanks to all the attendees for the, the questions. I want to thank everyone for joining uh, our seminar on planning, design, and climate actions for renewable energy transitions. Um, with that, I think I will close us out as well as ask you, Ye Kang, if you have any last closing remarks. Yeah, uh, yeah, I want to thank you everyone again and uh, thank you McKenna for moderating this session. Um, yeah, this is the very last <laughs> webinar of our webinar series starting from last August. So yeah, we are really wrapping up this uh, webinar series nicely. And uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to thank uh, Grace Graham, our student assistant, who has been helping as a like behind the scene to do all the logistics and the help and arrangement for these 11 webinars in a row. So yeah, thank you um, everyone and thank you Grace and see you in the next um, activity. <laughs> so please stay tuned in our uh, social media and websites and I would love to see you again. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening and the morning and afternoon. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>